Gwyn, Lord of Sunlight, was the first Lord of Light. He feared the darkness, feared what it would do to his age of fire. So he surrounded himself with powerful allies, even splitting his own soul so that their power could be greater. They would all fail him in the end. Most abandoned the kingdom. One went mad, another tried to relight the first flame, but none compared to the treachery of the Four Kings. The Four Kings who ruled over New Londo were praised for their foresight, yet still they succumbed to the temptations of the Abyss. In exchange for the art of life drain, the Four Kings gave up their kingdoms to Dark. These were the events of long, long ago, and today no one remembers the King's names. However, names change, but the story remains the same, and four kings again lose their kingdoms to the Abyss. One of the four is Vendrick, the present Lord of Light. Like Gwyn before him, Vendrick surrounded himself with allies he trusted. He favoured simple warriors, who staked their every battle on strength alone, and he valued knowledge of all things. My lord made magnificent findings on souls, an accomplishment for the ages. He vanquished the four great ones and built this kingdom upon their souls. Our king has watched over this land since ages long, long ago. The man was born to rule. When he heard that the giants from across the sea held a threat to his kingdom, he vanquished them and claimed their strength. When the Iron Kingdom fell, Vendrick sent his soldiers to claim the replete stores of iron held in Broom Tower. And when the Undead Curse threatened his own kingdom, Vendrick created monstrosities in the name of the greater good. Everything he did, he did for his kingdom. To serve him, the king had two he valued above all others. Rame and Velstad. These men were known as the left and right arms of the king, even though they were as different as night and day. Rame, the darker brother, cared deeply for his king. He sought the man's admiration, and saw Vendrick as a regal father figure. His great shield was emblazoned with a great raven, an omen of death, but it was Rame's favourite bird. This great shield would one day be the only thing left of him in Drang Lake, a foreshadowing of his fate. Valstad, the right arm of the king, was always at Vendrick's side, as if he were his lord's own shadow. They say Drangleic is no place for any cleric with ambition, yet Valstad had risen to the top, and remained the exception to his lord's disregard of miracles. The lore tells us that Valstad was lured to Drangleic from a faraway land, but forgot even why he came. You can trace the man's origins to the sunken kingdom of Shulva, where even now, amongst the ruins, a wrathful queen summons a follower in his image, such was his loyalty. This queen brought destruction to her people and to her king. She rose to power by gaining favour with the king and by singing to the ancient dragon they worshipped. When the king of Shulva realised her true nature, it was already too late. The ancient dragon awoke and spewed poison over the entire city, until only Alana the squalid queen remained. If Falstart is indeed from Shulva, one has to wonder how he didn't see history repeating itself. For the darkness was rising, and his king was in danger. Alana was not the only child of dark seeking a king. A woman named Nishandra arrived in Drangleic and began courting the current king. She warned our lord of the looming threat across the seas of the giants. The king crossed the ocean and defeated the giants with the queen at his side. There was no better way to seduce Vendrick, and the queen knew it. He valued this kingdom above all else and would vanquish any enemy to keep it safe. So one has to ask, were the giants ever a threat? Or were they simply a target Nishandra used to gain Vendrick's trust? Regardless, Vendrick conquered the giant's homeland and counted the battle as one. The queen brought peace to this land and to her king. A peace so deep, it was like the dark. A man can be judged by the company he keeps, and the company Vendrick kept was loyal indeed. Valstad the Royal Aegis 
would follow his king into darkness if need be. But there is a difference between loyalty to a king and loyalty to a kingdom. So only one saw Nishandra for what she truly was, while the other was blinded by faith. Rain. Rain was denounced as a traitor for speaking for his kingdom, but against the king and queen. Valstad, utterly faithful towards the crown, would vanquish Rain for daring to question the monarchy. So the two arms of the king clashed, instead of facing the true threat. Nishandra had eliminated any threats to the kingdom, and had found a king blinded by love. She was perfectly poised to usurp the throne, and Rain saw it. The king's tragic flaw was his pride, and Velstat's flaw was his mindless faith. For without tolerating those who challenge us, how can we grow? The light is always moving forward, and the darkness will only win when the light stops seeking it out. With the kingdom at peace, Nishandra had halted the kingdom's momentum, and darkness crept closer. Velstad should have recognized the pattern that took place long ago in Shulva. Both of his kings were being manipulated by a child of dark, yet Velstad did nothing to stop it happening again. His faith in his king was absolute, the truth irrelevant. The king valued strength and loyalty, and both were on display here. Velstad fought for his king, Raim for the fate of his kingdom. Both were loyal, both were powerful, yet Valstart was the victor. Raim was not killed for his treason, he was exiled. His strength had not been enough, so he left the kingdom in search of greater strength. He would never return. He had learned that being right is meaningless without power to back it up. Anyone could see that the kingdom was deteriorating under Nishandra's rule, yet Valstart's faith had overpowered the truth. Velstad had come from a kingdom where a dark queen remained, so perhaps Raim set out to check if other kingdoms had suffered the same fate. So it was that he found himself in Broom Tower, a place that had once belonged to the Iron King before his fall. It was common knowledge that the Iron King had taken no queen, so what Raim found there must have chilled him and confirmed his fears about Nishandra. The entire tower had been enveloped by a black fog, it repelled any who came close, haunting suits of armor and fighting off any soldiers who attempted to enter. However, Raim was not most soldiers. A stalwart warrior, Raim had the ability to expunge the Black Fog. He was strong, and tracked the Black Fog to its source at the base of the tower. Amongst the remnants of a past kingdom covered in ash was Nadalia, the Ashen Maiden. Nadalia arrived at this tower seeking a king but was too late. The king she seeked had already sunk below the molten iron, and his rule had passed. Dispirited, this child of dark made Broom Tower her home, in the place she might have ruled alongside her king. Perhaps Raim's original intent was to banish Nadalia, the dark queen of Broom Tower. If he could do this, then he could return with proof to his kingdom and make his king see the truth. At some point after entering Broom Tower though, this changed. Just like Raim, Nadalia was deprived of a king and kingdom. Perhaps they found some mutuality in this, for Raim decided to trust this child of dark, allowing her to cling to his sword in her miasmic form. Raim was reborn, granted true purpose under a newfound mother rather than a regal father. Which begs the question. Could such a queen be evil, or was Raim another victim of a dark queen's manipulation? After Raim left Drangleic, the kingdom collapsed. The giants invaded with a revenge in their hearts, and Nishandra took the throne, forcing Vendrick into hiding. Valstad followed his king into the undead crypt, where he would guard him in darkness forever. Raim remained in Brim Tower, protecting the Ashen Maiden from harm. And then you come, seeking answers in empty kingdoms. This video is supported by Patreon.com and all of my supporters over there. Basically, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's similar to Kickstarter in that you give money for a project, but it's different than Kickstarter because you give this money per month, and it's generally not a very big amount, it's usually just a couple of bucks every month if you appreciate that person's videos. and. 
That's what about 800 people do for me over on Patreon, and as such, I was able to remove all of the really annoying ads on these videos, which essentially means that 800 people are making it so that about 300,000 people don't have to watch ads, and that's amazing. If you want to become one of those 800 people making it so that I don't have to rely on ads, then you can go click over on that Patreon page, there's a video there where I explain it in a bit more depth, and I really hope that you support that, because even if you don't choose to support me, it's a really good page that supports really good content creation, so maybe you'll find someone else over there that's worth supporting, so check it out. And I hope you're enjoying Prepare to Cry, because there's more to come in the next few months, and I'll see you guys next time.